come to you today, Lord, and we lift your name on high, Lord. We thank you for everything that you've done. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you're comforter in a time of despair. We thank you that you're provider when our finances might not line up with what we need. We thank you that you are love. That when we feel unloved, we have your love, God. And we thank you so much for that unconditional love. We thank you that you are salvation, Jesus. In 1 John 4, 9 through 10, Scripture says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. I really feel that there's somebody here this morning that needs to grasp that concept that God loves you regardless. He loves you on your good days. He loves you on your bad ways the same way. We are coming into a new year. This is the time between Christmas and the new year, and it's a little bit weary because we're tired. If you got kids, you're really, really tired because they got so many toys and you got to figure out somewhere to put them. But, <laughs> but um, I really feel that this point in between Christmas and New Year is a time to get close to God and ask Him to take those heavy things off of you because you have purpose on your back. We have things that we have to get done for the kingdom of God. There's things that need to be done for our families our children, the next generation that's coming. And I just really believe that you can take this time and just ask God to shake off what it is that you've been carrying. It's not yours to carry. It's not yours to carry. He's there with you. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, welcome to the Christian Center. Our desire is that you would encounter God, find community, and fulfill your purpose. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year because we won't be here. We'll be here on the 3rd. So, Merry Christmas. We're transitioning you to the next part of service. We're going to take three minutes to greet everybody. And we'll have some people walking around with gum and mints. What's up? What's up, guys? Hey, how was Christmas? Yeah. I kind of asked that already, but um, ours was good. Thanks for asking. It was great. Uh, so, this is like the first time. My son always is four, so I got to buy him like extra figures and boy, like all the boy toys like I had like, when I was a kid, and it was super exciting. You're uh, playing with them. I wasn't the best steward of my finances leading up to it because I was like, give me this and this and this and this. Uh, so, but we took some back. I was going to take it back. Don't worry. All right, cool. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you this morning, God. We thank you for your word, or as we look into your word, as we open it, Lord, we pray that you would... Uh, bring revival in our hearts, that you would bring reformation in our minds, that you would grow us and mold us into your likeness, that you would uh, send the living word to divide the truth from the lies, that you would uh, just help us to grow in understanding and knowledge and wisdom and in application. God, give us the grace to apply what we hear today and to follow you in all of your ways. In name we pray, amen. 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 All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is the... Uh, this is the last service of the year, so if it's bad, you can just pretend like it was a year ago. Okay, <laughs> we'll come back next week. That'll be fine. It'll be New Year, New Year, all that stuff. Okay, so uh, open the Bible to Psalm 147. Psalm 147. The title of the message this morning is "Fear and Love: A Life That Pleases God." So you can write that all together. You can just write "A Life That Pleases God." How many of y'all want to live a life that pleases God? Yeah. Yeah. I thought so. So, let's read this together. Psalm 147. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Check. We did that. Okay. Praise the Lord. And we still are. <laughs> for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. Let's just follow quick. A song of praise is fitting. You ever, like, tell someone, like, give them a compliment, and they're like, uh, uh, they don't know like, what to do, like, uh, uh, don't know how to respond to it, right? When we talk about God, like, we, we sing His praise, we couldn't sing enough. We couldn't say enough about how good He is, about, yeah. about His nature, about His yeah. qualities, about His character, about His yeah. benefits. We, we can't say enough, but whatever we do say, it's fitting. But whatever praise we do bring to God, it's fitting, and it's due His name. So, let us always be quick to praise the Lord. Let us always...
be ready to offer up the sound of praise. It says, The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. Amen. He casts the wicked to the ground. Amen. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. Amen. He gives uh, to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his coal? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and waters flow. Bars. Y'all didn't know that David was a rapper, did y'all? So, he makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. The Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, uh, in, this, in this psalm, we see uh, this, the, the power of God on display. And we're reading things like, great is our Lord. He's abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. We read that he's uh, covering the heavens with clouds. He numbers the stars. And he sends his word out with authority. That he sends his word and melts them, it says. It says that he hurls down crystals of ice. Who can stand before his, his cold? Right? This is, this is some like mighty wording. Right? When we read this, like we get a glimpse of the power of God. It says, uh, we also, though, we see his, his careful love and his attentiveness. The Lord, it says, in, as we read in this psalm, that he builds and gathers up his people, that he heals the brokenhearted, that he binds up their wounds, that he lifts the humble, that he gives animals their food, that he protects and defends, that he strengthens your children and makes peace within your borders, that he provides and shows favor. Right? So I, I like this psalm because as we read the, the breadth of the scripture, you know, it's kind of overwhelming. It's like, man, it's still it's going on. And on, and he does that, and he does that, and he does that, and he is this, and he is that. And it's kind of overwhelming, but that is the nature of God. Yeah. He is overwhelming. <laughs> he, it goes on and on and on. And when you think that you know or have a grasp of who he is, there's more still. Yeah. And, and still, and still, and still. Yeah. And so it's good that we learn more about him, but that we always uh, choose to continue to learn more about him because allow him to reveal himself. That's the other thing is that we don't get to we don't get to decide who God is because he has revealed himself. Yeah. Right? We don't get to determine what he's like because he's already revealed himself. Yeah. He's already told us what he's like. So as we read this, we stuff like this, we begin to see that. And I love this because we see, you know, on one hand we see like the power and the strength and the might of God, and on the other hand we see like his loving nature and his attentiveness, and that he's careful and that he's mindful of his creation. Right? So you got this balance. And this was right in the middle of this psalm, uh, in verse 10 and 11, it says that uh, there's actually a group of lines that shows us how to relate to this amazing God. It actually shows us how we can relate to him. And not just to relate to him, but how to please him. It shows us how we can please this God that we are reading about, this God who is mighty and powerful, who sends ice crystals. Y'all thought that was just, he thought Lord of the Rings just made that up. He thought they did not want to get with that. No, God, it says he sent ice crystals, right? right? Like he sends his word and he melts them. That, that the stars, uh, he knows every single star that he's numbered them all, right? Like we can actually learn how not just to live in existence with this God, but how to live in relationship with him and how to please him. That is, that is mind blowing. That we can, we can actually uh, live a life that pleases this God. Verse 10 and 11 is where it says, it says, his delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor is his pleasure in the legs of man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. All of our best efforts, all of our best preparations in coming to God are just smoke and vanity. Everything that we can do within ourselves to, to, to bring God our best, to show him like, okay, I'm going to go meet God. Here I am. I'm going to put, you know, put on all my best. And I'm here. It's all empty. 
And one theologian actually says that, do, that doing this is only a hindrance in the way of the mercy of God. That our preparations to please God in our own power, in our own ability, in the, you know, in the strength of a horse, in the legs of a man, like those are, those are just analogous pictures for us. It, as, as we prepare the best we can, even the best we have only uh, it, it amounts to us uh, obstructing ourselves from the mercy of God. Obstructing ourselves from the mercy that He wants to freely give us. And this is the mercy of God, is that the only way to please Him is the way that you naturally respond to Him. The way that man naturally responds to God, to the person of God, is the only way to please Him. So if we puff ourselves up in pride, if we approach God uh, thinking that we are something more than we are, if we come to God, you know, uh, proud of our accomplishments and our achievements and all these things, and we're going to show Him that we've earned it, right? No, no good. But instead, if we respond in hope, in His love, if we respond in fear of who God is, which is kind of our natural inclination, anyway, that pleases Him. That is the mercy of God, that the way that you would act naturally in response to Him is what pleases Him. And we're going we're gonna to look a little more into that, because y'all like, what are you even talking about? So, it says that God delights in those who fear Him, and in those who hope in His steadfast love. So what, what's the association? What's the common denominator in fear and in hope? Because we read about fear and hope, and like, those words don't go together. Fear is from the devil. Hope is from God. How can we have both and please God? Right? But there is some association in here that maybe we're, we're, not, uh, we're not seeing from the get-go. And we'll, we'll like unpack it a little bit, but ultimately it comes down to humility. It comes down to, to vulnerability. It comes down to weakness and to being at the mercy of God, to understanding our position before Him. And so um, it says that God takes pleasure in those who fear Him. What does this say about God? What is, I'm going to tell myself a little bit, but, uh, you know, so being the father of two boys, two very rowdy boys, they're not babies anymore, they are boys. And they don't want you like, hey, have a baby. Have a baby. Babies are great. They don't tell you about what those babies turn into. So babies, if you have a girl, I'm sure, great. But boys, they turn into a monster. Like it's a baby, <laughs> monster, boy. And so I've got two of those. And they are very, uh, we, guys, we haven't slept. I don't even know the last time we slept. Uh, it's just like, we're like routine now. We're just, uh, shh, shh, go to sleep. All right. I've noticed if I walk into the middle of the night and I'm frustrated, then you know, don't hold this against me, okay? Mm -hmm. I, if I walk into the middle of the night and I'm frustrated and I respond out of my frustration in the middle of the night, go to bed. I'll get this phone. Oh, oh, go to bed. <laughs> they get on the covers real quick. They go to bed, right? But I found that if I do that a couple times, when I walk in the room and I'm like, hey, you're in my head, and like, I want to hug, they're like, go, go under the covers because they're like, oh no, he's here. Let's hide. You know, they're fearful. Like, oh, let's hide. So what does it say about, you know, that may be more convenient and longer, but that's ultimately not how I want to parent my kids. Like, I would rather have, you know, have them from the heart, where they would respond and <laughs> obey me and stuff from their heart, not because they're afraid I'm going to punish them or, you know, whatever. But what does it say about God if uh, it, says that it actually brings some delight that we fear Him? I think it just depends on our understanding of what fear is, of what we're talking about here. Right? God doesn't want to lord it over you that he could smush you in a moment. God doesn't want to walk in the room and be like, you like run away and hide because here he is, like in his power, his might, right? That's not well, what, what his heart is. The essential meaning of fear is, according to Miriam Webster, an unpleasant emotion caused by being aware of danger or feeling of being afraid to expect with alarm, okay? Uh, another definition I have is a feeling of respect and wonder for something very powerful. Right? A feeling of respect and wonder for something yeah. that's very powerful, which, how many of you know God is very powerful? The word fear is more complex, I think, than we might realize at first. Right? Like, um, the, this word fear, and the Bible uses it in different ways as well. Um, for example, go to Exodus 20, Exodus 20, verse 18. So this is, uh, the, the people of God are standing, uh, at, uh, they're standing around there. Moses is about to go up and get the Ten Commandments. In verse 18 it says, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of trumpet and the mountain smoking. Y'all getting scared? That's scary. Imagine being there. This is like, this is like surround sound IMAX to the next level. Like this is like 
crazy. Now when all people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning, 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 lightning. <laughs> that was crazy. Uh, and the sound of trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. See, I think we read that today in our context today and like where our position like with God through Jesus and we'll look at that. That's a bit dramatic, guys. That's come on. You, if he talks, you're gonna die. But this was their reality. Like, this was this was what they <laughs> this was the reality of their situation. Don't let him talk to us or we will die. We're gonna stand way over here. You just talk to him to, to him, Moses, and then tell us what he said. Like just let us know what he said, right? Because we're we're scared. Uh, it says, but then Moses said to the people, do not fear. For God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that we may not sin. So it can be a little confusing, because he says, do not fear. But then he says, the fear of the Lord is before you. So we have two uses of the same word fear, but it's like, wait, do not fear, but fear is here. Fear of the Lord is here, but don't be afraid. But the fear of the Lord is here, and it's here for your benefit. It's kind of like, huh? So... We see here in the same in this one line an admonition to not fear, but at the same time the very same word is used to show God's good intention. Right? Don't be afraid. Don't do that. Don't respond in fear. The fear of the Lord is before you, it goes on to say, so that you may not sin. So don't be afraid, even though your response is to be afraid. Don't be afraid because it's actually here for your benefit. The fear of the Lord is actually here to lead you and to keep you from falling into sin. Yeah. So even though the fear of the Lord is here and among you, it is God's good will. It is, it is, your, it is for your benefit to keep you from falling into sin. That's so don't, don't be afraid that the fear of the Lord is here. Because it's actually for your benefit. Many times, many times throughout Scripture, we read about man's interaction with God in the presence of God becoming fearful. How many times have you read, do not be afraid? Do not be afraid. It is Lord. Like, don't be afraid. Right, so go to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, 1. I love this little passage. It says, uh, In the year that King Uzziah, right, so this is Isaiah having a vision of the throne room of heaven. It says, In the year uh, that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. Again, we see just the power, just in the voice of God, just in this voice that created all that you see around you. The power, just in his voice. It says, uh, and I said, Woe is me. For I am lost, for I am a man unclean, of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Right, and it says, Then one seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth. And he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. So Isaiah's response, this is God's man. This is the prophet of God. And he's having a vision of God in the throne room of heaven. And his response is, oh no, I'm not, I'm not worthy. Like he's like, just hearing the voice of God. Seeing, seeing a, a picture and an image of who he is. And his response was, oh no. Hebrews 12, 21 was referencing Moses before God at Mount Sinai. What we just read about in Exodus. and says, indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. He said, I tremble with fear. Uh, one theologian said that by nature we dread the presence of God, and justly so, for he is the judge of the world, and our sins hold us guilty. Death and hell must come to our minds whenever we think of God. Hence is that dread which, man, which makes men shun God as much as they can. So, uh, I think one thing that we talk about when it comes to God is, is righteousness, and being uh, righteous before God. And to be righteous is to be in right standing with God. Right? So if I'm, if I'm righteous, it's not that I uh, am perfect. It's not that I do things well all the time. It's that um, I am in right standing with God because of His Son Jesus. Right? Because of what yes. He did for me. And so righteousness just means right standing. 
Yeah. If you don't really get that concept, the next time you walk into a room and you can't look somebody in the eye, or you can't walk up and greet them, or you, you kind of walk in like, oh, and you kind of walk away, like that, you are, you are not in right standing with that person. Okay? Yeah. Like, because if you walk in and you can't, like, walk up to somebody and, you know, greet them and love them and, and have that, that relationship with them that you normally would have, your that relationship is not in right standing. Right? And a lot of us uh, don't understand what God has done for us to put us in right standing with himself. So we walk into a place like this and we're like, mm. yeah. uh. so we don't understand that we are already righteous because of what Jesus did. Amen. So that we are in right standing with God. Yes. Right? And so that's what he's talking about here in this, in this quote I just read. He said that it's our nature to trade God because we realize that he's the judge of the world. And the sin that we carry uh, actually is what separates us from God. Right? That's not just some mythical idea that we talk about. That's a reality. Yeah. That the sins yeah. that we walked in before Jesus actually separate us from God. Yes. And so when we think of God, we become fearful. When we think of God, we think, oh no, he's going to get me. That's why people say, like, I'm just going to live my life and then one day I'll get right. They know, they're, they know what they're doing is wrong, but they're like, oh, one day. But they know, you know, if, something, if one day were to come, their response would not be one of elation and jubilee. It would be one of fear and trembling <laughs> and yeah. oh no. Right? Because the judge of the world, the, 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 the one who judges sin... Uh, is present and our response we're not conscious of him we're conscious of our sin and so because of that we respond in fear so he says that's why we have people that like they'll they'll go through a little rough patch and they'll just disappear from church they won't show up for like six months like what what, what are you doing like this is where you come to fix it yeah but but they yeah. but the, the, and i've been there like i don't know if i've ever talked about this when i was a junior in high school i decided i was gonna go have my little prodigal season and i was like you know what i'm gonna quit going to church i was like you know people always say that there's hypocrites in the church I ain't going to add to that. I'm not going to change the way I'm living, so I'm so quick on church. Right? That, that's real great uh, That's real great thinking right there. Uh, it was pretty backwards, but it didn't serve me well, I'll tell you that. It did, it did not serve me well. Yeah. Uh, but God in His grace, you know, restored me and uh, fixed all that stupidity uh, that was going on there. But, uh, but it's actually, you know, not God's heart that we would stay in that place. Yeah. And so, one thing that we have to understand from the you know, from the onset is that you know just because God is love and just because God loves us does not mean that we get to take for granted the fact that we should we should fear Him that we should still hold Him in awe and understand our place uh, our position before Him because this is what we need to understand is that God is Almighty mm -hmm. God is Almighty and Almighty means He's omnipotent He has all power God has all power He's omniscient He's all knowing He's omnipresent He's everywhere in everything. And being such, he is to be feared. He is to be revered. He is to be admired and held in awe. Because of who God is, we fear him. Because of, because of who he is, because of his being, we fear God. Because we are just man. We are only man. He is creator. We are not. Right? So because of who he is, we fear him. Yes. John MacArthur said, The fear of the Lord is a state of mind in which one's own attitudes will, feelings, deeds, and goals are exchanged for God's. And I love that definition. Like it, it really helps us grasp what it is to fear the Lord. It says the fear of the Lord is a state of mind in which one's own attitudes, our own feelings, our own deeds, our own will are actually exchanged for those of God. So now it's not just what, what, is, what is it that I want in life? What is it that I desire to see fulfilled? What is it that I want to accomplish? But it's, God, what do you want to accomplish? God, what is your will? God, what are the deeds that you want done? What are the feelings that you have, God? I want to give what I have. I want to lay it down and take on yours. That is the fear of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we just got to come to the place where we realize that we don't know best. That we're not in control. That we're not the ones calling the shots. That this is not our show. That this is not our party. But that it's His. And that we are here to serve God. We, are, we exist for God. It's not the other way around. Yes. God does not exist for you and me. Amen. God is not hanging around because he's just waiting for us to rub the bottle and say, Genie, Genie, I wish, blah, blah, and just throw out our little, our little phrases and then he's just going to work for us. right? God does not work for you and me. We exist for him. We have to learn to, as the Bible tells us, lean not on our own understanding but in all our ways to acknowledge him. 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Foolishness to God. And I also, I didn't write down, but I read or two that 
uh, you know, someone, and this wasn't like in, in the scripture, but this was just someone like take, like, on, on this subject, being mindful of this subject, was that, uh, you know, the harshness, the harshness of God is still softer than the, the kindest kindness of man. Mm. What we would consider to be harsh by God is, is still kinder and more merciful than what we would consider kindness of man. That's good. Psalm uh, one eleven ten says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yes. Right. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs one seven kind of echoes this and says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Yes. Okay. So knowledge and wisdom sound familiar. They're like cousins. They're, it's not the same thing. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. These are not the same word. These actually all have their own purpose. Okay. So to knowledge, you can know something and not have any wisdom on how to apply it. Yeah. You can have you know understanding in an area, but not really have any any knowledge to accomplish to like accomplish that. Okay. So, um, there, it says that the fear of the Lord is actually the beginning of these things. Amen. To walk in the fear of the Lord is, is the beginning of knowledge, is the beginning of understanding. A lot of people these days got opinions. A lot of these people <laughs> out there telling us what's what and what's not and what is what. Uh, y'all can, I, I don't even have to go into it. Y'all already offended right now. Lord, we repent. <laughs> We're sorry. Uh, you guys already know what I'm talking about. But if it's not grounded in the fear of the Lord, it is not true knowledge. It is not true wisdom. It is not true understanding. There can be no, no wisdom. There can be no true knowledge outside of a reverence and a submissive, all-filled fear of God. Yes. There can be no foundation for knowledge, no foundation for truth or for understanding without first walking in an all-filled heart submitted to God, walking in the fear of the Lord. But see, like, I know it's kind of hard because, like, the... Uh, the culture that we live in is very, you know, uh, only strong survive, survival, you know, the fittest, get yours before they get theirs, like that kind of stuff. And it serves us well in this life, but if we're not careful, sometimes we can take that mentality into how we approach God. And we come to God, we're like, God, I got this, like, I'm good, I got mine, like, don't worry about me, you're too busy, go help someone else, whatever. And we can actually start to make the own decisions, you know, for our life, and we can kind of leave God out of the process, and we kind of become Lord of our own lives, and we kind of start to dictate like everything about our life, and we get to make all the decisions about our life, and we, we forget the reverence and the fear and the submissive heart towards God along the way. So it's important that we just remember our position before Him. And, uh, you know, but, you know, like, we're talking about the fear of the Lord. We don't want to, we ain't afraid of God. He loves us. I know. He does. Uh, but, you know, God in His goodness uh, has actually offered benefits to people who will walk in the fear of the yeah. Lord. Yes. Yes. And so he's not just like, you know, I'm scary, do what I say. He's like, no, uh, because of who I am, this is kind of how you respond. Uh, but if you do that, here are some benefits to walking in the fear of the Lord. Amen. Right? So throughout the Bible, I mean, there's tons, but uh, some of the things that the Bible says accompany the fear of God are strong confidence. Right, so in this life, you can choose if you want to fear God or if you want to fear man. You can choose. Yeah. You will find that a lot of freedom comes when you decide to fear God yes. yeah. and not fear man. Yes. And don't care what, what man's reaction is. Don't care what man has to say. Don't care what if you are obeying and being obedient to what God has put in front of you, what God has uh, called you to, then you're choosing to put you. You cannot do both. You can, the moment you decide to fear man and man's opinion and man's thought and man's acceptance and these things, you cannot fear the Lord anymore. Because now you've made those things Lord in your life. Yeah. And you've removed him from the place that he rightfully uh, owns. And so you either fear God or you fear man. And so if you fear, fear God, he'll give you strong confidence. Because now you're not, you're not confident in yourself, but in him. Yeah. Right? And he doesn't fail. And he's faithful. Yeah. And it comes through every time he says yeah. it. So your confidence is now not rooted in yourself, but in who he is. And so uh, that's one thing. A refuge for your offspring. All right, so safety for your kids, uh, a fountain of life, an abundant of abundant goodness from God. Just from walking in a life that's that's reverential towards God and walking in the fear of the Lord, He promises abundant goodness. Uh, a, walking in the fear of the Lord also attracts the eye of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to attract the eye of God. Yeah. I want God to to walk, look at my life, and I want Him to be drawn towards what it is that I'm on mission doing, what it is that I'm uh, putting my hands to, what it is that I'm doing. I want to, everything I do, reflect Him, walk in submission to Him, so that I attract His eye. Yes. It says, uh, walking in the fear of the Lord also gives a protection and deliverance. 
provision without lack. Riches, honor, and life. How many of y'all want some riches and honor? Yeah. 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 Or some life. It takes some life. <laughs> riches, honor, life. And these are things, benefits from walking in the fear of the Lord. And so I love this because it's actually just a process. Y'all, like, we just harping on this. This is just the foundation. It's going to get good, guys. Like, it's already good, but it's going to get better. Okay? So the, the fear of the Lord is we've read this foundation for truth, this foundation for knowledge, this foundation for understanding. Right? And the fear of God causes us to gain understanding. But this understanding grows that we may know God. Okay, so we fear God. That's the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of knowledge. As we do that, that understanding and knowledge, it begins to grow in us and we actually begin to know God. Yeah. And as we know God, we can't help but love God. Yes. As you begin to know God for His nature, as you begin to know God for His heart, as you begin to know God for all that He thinks of you and all that He does for you and all that He, he wants for you, you can't help but to respond to God in love. You can't help but love this God who loves so openly. And when he puts it on display, you got to be a real Scrooge not to love someone back who loves you so yeah. committedly, so faithfully, yeah. so devotedly. It, it will naturally draw you to love him the more you begin to know and understand him. So I got it in my notes. You can write it like this. Fearing God, arrow, like leads to knowing God, arrow, loving God. So fearing God helps us to know God. And knowing God helps us to love God. But it has to go in that order. Because people want to say that they love God, but they don't fear Him, so they don't really know Him. So they love their concept and their idea of who God might be, or what God might do, but they don't really have an understanding. And then when something comes up in life that contradicts their picture, it shatters. Because it's not grounded in truth. It's not rooted in the reality of who He really is. And so we begin in the fear of God. We begin... Where it starts, where knowledge is found, and then from there, as we grasp knowledge, we begin to know. And as we know, then we can love God. Okay. And so I said earlier that because of who God is, we fear Him. Right? I said earlier. Because of who God is, we fear Him. But at the same time, as we begin to know who God is, we can't help but to love Him. Right? So it's this two-handed thing that we read. Right? Because it, it doesn't say, uh, it doesn't say it, his delight is not in the strength of the horse or the blaze of man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. And then it just keeps moving on. No, it says, in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast life. It's both. It's one and the same. Right? So as we fear him uh, for, who he, for who he is, we begin to love him as we know and understand him. So this is the rest of the equation. That God is also pleased with those who hope in his steadfast love. Those who hope in his steadfast love. Well, again, we can't separate. We can't choose. God, I just, I just want the love part. I don't want to fear you, God. Right? No, he's pleased in both. He's pleased in those who fear and those who hope in his steadfast love. God, because of his being, his being, B-E-I-G, because of his being, requires fear. Right? Like, that's just what he, what it exudes, what it meant, who he is. His being, it, it requires fear. Admiration, awe, reverence, submission. God doesn't have to prove to you that he's worthy. God shows up, boom, like, oh, like we know, right? It's just because of who he is. Like that's our response. But because of his nature, he desires you to hope and to know his love. So because of who he is, we fear him, but because of his nature. So his being causes us to, in my track, you know, track, because of his being, because of who he is, we fear him. But because of his nature, Right, because of his personality, because of his characteristics, he wants us, because of his goodness, he wants us not only to fear him, but to, to grow and to know the hope of his love. Amen. I mean, that's like somebody, I'm trying to think of somebody who I know. You guys, you guys got like a big scary friend? Does anybody have like a big scary friend? Like you got like a big, like scary, like bodybuilder friend, and you're like, oh my god, you're huge. And like, like, uh, maybe it's just a dude thing, I don't know, but I got some friends that are like, I got one guy that literally lives in the gym, and I was like, when I first met him, I was like, I was like, hey, hey, I'm Josh, nice to meet you, right, like, my response was, oh my god, don't beat me up, please, right, but as I got to know him, he's actually like, now he just like, I can just bully him and like, pick, like, he lets me, he lets me, just, I can't really do it, but he lets me kind of pick on him and like, you know, give him a hard time and stuff, he lets me, 
uh, just kind of, you know, bust down a little bit sometimes. But if he wanted to, he could kill me. But he chooses not to, right? But as I got to know him, I was able to be his friend because I knew he was actually a good guy. He actually was a compassionate dude. Like, he, you know, he actually, like, we're bros now. Like, there's, there's a level of love there. You know, we talk smack about uh, football and stuff. Not too much because I still have a healthy amount of fear uh, that he could, if he wanted to, uh, decide to, you know, uh, escalate the relationship in a negative way. And so, uh, some of us respond to God that way. All we ever know of God is that he's big and scary, but we never actually grow in this understanding of who he, what he's like. And so it's hard for us to really love him or to hope in that love. Um, and so, it's the initial response of man, uh, the initial response of man towards God is to fear. And I'm talking, I'm not talking to the saints this morning, I'm just talking about mankind, okay? The natural response of mankind is to re respond in fear to the thought of God, to who God is. That, that's why, uh, you know, people say the church isn't for me, or this and that, because they have this mentality, this idea of who God is, but they are really just aware of their own brokenness. Uh, yeah. That we all carry, yep. but they don't know there's an answer. Yeah. And so th they're aware of that more than they are of who God is. So when they think of God, their response is fear. But God, the Father, He loves you so much that He sent His Son Jesus, Amen. not just to die for you, but to deliver you from that fear. Amen. To deliver Amen. you from the bondage of fear. Because it is our natural inclination, hear me this morning, to respond to God with, oh no. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of judgment. I'm afraid of falling short. I'm afraid of missing the mark. But as we associate ourselves, not with ourselves, but with Jesus and with what he did, he's actually pulled us out of that fear. So that when we think of God, our expectation is not one of fear, it's not one of judgment, but it's one of hope in this love that he has for us. Amen. He sent his son to die for us, that we would approach him with boldness and with confidence. Again, it's got to be in order. People find this scripture and they're like, I'll walk into church and I'll just kick the door open and I'll put my feet up on the chair and say, all right, God, here I am. I'm bold and confident. Show up. That's not what it's talking about. Again, we're rooting this knowledge, this understanding in the fear of God. And so as we do that, we begin to understand who he is. And now we're understanding that, hey, uh, even though like, this is kind of scary, there's been a substitute provided to take my place. And so now because of that, I am confident and I can approach with God with boldness. Not in like my goodness. I'm not. I'm not confident. Like man, I, I that was a really good song list this morning. And like I'm confident. God, let's worship some more. But that's not what we're talking about. I say I'm confident in what Jesus did. Amen. I'm yeah. confident in who He is yeah. for me. Yes. So I can approach God with confidence yes. that my sin is no longer separated from me. Amen. That that my my shortcomings are no longer what God sees, but He actually sees Jesus. And he accepts me because of that. So now I approach with confidence and boldness, not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done. Yeah. Right? And so he says uh, that we can approach with boldness and confidence, knowing that he loves us and that we belong to him if we accept Jesus' death on behalf of our transgressions. So 2 Timothy 1.7, For God gave us not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Or sound mind. So Paul, in addressing Timothy's fear, see if Timothy was a young man who was leading a church and he was in the ministry, and, and he was dealing with some fear, and he probably was, you know, having a little little uh, identity crisis. He was kind of forgetting who he was in God, and forgetting uh, all that God said about him and all that God equipped him to do. Remember, Paul tells him, hey, stir up that gift inside of you. That was given to you by God. Quit doing this in your own yeah. ability. Stir up the gift of God inside Amen. of you. And so as he's you know, dealing with this, this fear now because you know, he has opponents and he has people that are opposed to what he's doing. And there's people who think he should do it this way. People who know better and over here and all this stuff going on. And he's starting to deal with this fear because he's lost grip of the truth of who he is in God. And so now he's battling with fear. And so Paul is telling him, hey, that, that spirit of fear that you're dealing with, that is not the spirit that God gave you. God did not give you that spirit. God did not give you that spirit of fear that you're holding on to. He actually gave you the spirit of power and love and self-control. That's the spirit that God gave you. And he's actually pointing back towards a, an earlier writing in Romans 8, where he says in verse 15, the spirit received was not one of slavery to fall back into fear, but the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry to the Father. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Amen. Amen. And so the spirit that God gives you, again, when you walk before God, when you walk into this world with your natural equipment, your response to God is fear. But when you choose Jesus and when you put your faith in him and in what he's done for you, God accepts you and he makes you part of his family. Yes. He says what Jesus did, what this man did is enough for all that. 
Now you're a part of me. Let's take away that fear of judgment. Let's take away that fear of punishment, that fear of the consequence of your sin. And now you can hope in my love and hope in my righteousness yeah. and hope in your justification and your right standing before me. Thank right? God. And so he says, this spirit that you're dealing with is not the spirit that I gave you. The spirit I gave you is one of power and love and the sound mind. The spirit I gave you actually testifies that you belong to me. Yeah. Says, the, the spirit that you've been given, he says in Romans 8, 15, he says, the spirit that you've been given is not the spirit of fear that pulls you back into what? Into bondage. Back into slavery of fear. See, when you read this, just read through it, you're kind of like, that's kind of weird. Like, it doesn't really make sense. But it does. Because he's talking, he's addressing this spirit that's at work in the body. A spirit that would, would want you to become more mindful of the fact that, that your sins are great and that you should fear God. Yes, you should fear God. Yes, you should walk in reverence. Yes, you should uh, walk in, admira in admiration and awe and surrender of who God is. But the, out the end outcome is not punishment for your sins. It's forgiveness of your sins. The spirit that God gave you, which leads to power, love, and sound mind, the spirit that God gave you actually testifies that you're his son. It testifies that you're his daughter. The Spirit of God combats those thoughts and that fear in your heart that says that you don't belong, that God's going to reject you. The Spirit of God actually testifies to the opposite. That no, you belong. That you are a son of God. That's good. The Spirit we have been given is not one that keeps us fearful, but one that makes us certain that we're loved by God. Yeah. So it pleases God that we fear Him and that we hope in His steadfast love. This is what Psalm told us, right? When we opened up. The spirit that God gives us actually helps us do that. Because it takes us from the place of being fearful, which I'm not saying you just do whatever you want. No, we still choose to surrender and obey and, uh, and hold God in awe and admiration and reverence. And we walk in the fear of the Lord. But the spirit of God actually takes us on that journey as we're fearing God. The spirit uh, of God comes along and it takes us and it pulls us away from just the fear of consequence. And it pulls us into the certainty that we are loved. And accepted by God. Yeah. We're not walking in the fear of the Lord to, to earn enough points to make Him happy. We're not walking in the fear of the Lord to do good long enough to get in. No, we are walking in the fear of the Lord because we recognize His station. We recognize who He is. And that's our response. But it's actually the Spirit of God working in us that reveals to us that we belong. That we are already accepted. So 1 John 4.16 just kind of asks this. It says, so we have come to know... What's up, brother, sis? This is a journey. This is one of, this is one of Jesus' disciples. Later stages in his life. He said, you know what? We have come to know and now believe the love that God has for us. Some of us struggle with believing that God loves us. Some of us yeah. go back and forth. Some of us have better times, better seasons in life where yeah. we, we know many and then we don't. And then this is what really gets you is you start to understand that God loves you and then you mess up and you think that changes. Mm -hmm. You start to love, you start to realize that God does love you. And then you look at something you should look at. Are you responding in a way you shouldn't? Are you holding up a finger you shouldn't have held up? Are you doing whatever, like whatever you do that you shouldn't have done? Now you think, oh, she doesn't love me anymore. Or now I gotta go back and earn this all over again. But that's not the truth. That's what the Spirit of God has been given to us. And so he says, as we've walked this out, this is the man who has walked his life following after Jesus and now serving his church and building it up. And he's saying here in the later stages of his life, we've come to know now and to believe. This love that God has for us. Amen. God affirms his love for us. That we would grow in this love and no longer fear judgment, but that we would grow in intimacy all the while holding on to the awe and the reverence of who he is. Right? So all of this is so that God can draw us closer to himself. Yes. Right? So the fear of the Lord is just, that's what we do. That's just how we respond. But coupled with that, alongside with that, he sends the Spirit to testify that, that we belong, that we are already accepted, that we are already proven, that we are sons and daughters. And so it just, it helps us to continue forward in this so we can grow in love, that we can grow in intimacy with the Father. That whole passage, 4, 6, 1 John 4, and verse 16 says, So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love, by this, by this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. See, so now we're like, we're at the thing where we started in the beginning. We're like, wait, it pleases God to fear him and to hope in his love. 
But fear is not from God, right? Because we read this and see, there's no fear in love. So how can we fear God and love God at the same time? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. So he's talking about the fear of punishment. So it pleases God that we fear him and that we hope in his steadfast love for us. But it's not so that we can uh, just kind of do whatever we want. No, there is no fear in love. And when it says no fear, it's talking about the fear of punishment. Right, so we still, we still walk in surrender to God. We still make him Lord of the lives. A lot of people will say Jesus is their Savior, but not Lord. He's both. Right, so as we walk in both of those things, uh, we, we find it. So love casts out the expectation. You remember the definition of fear? So love casts out that expectation of, with alarm, that dread of punishment or harm. It doesn't change the way we respond to God, but it just, it just removes that fear of punishment, that fear of what's coming at the end of the line. So to fear God is to submit to God, to surrender and to trust. In this place, we discover the steadfast love that God has for us. So surrendering to God is, is uh, in fear of who He is and putting our hope not in our ability, right, horses and men, but in His steadfast love. This is what brings God to life. Amen. Right? So not in our ability to conjure up enough strength or enough whatever or enough smarts in our own abilities and all this stuff to, to do what, you know, what it is that we want to accomplish, but that when we actually put our hope and our faith in His love, no respond in his in the fear of who he is. So Acts, y'all thought, wait, like, man, this is all from the Old Testament, but Acts 9, 31 says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. Right here. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So we read about this New Testament church who are doing exactly what we've been talking about. They're walking in the fear of the Lord. But along with that is the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen, there is something about walking in reverence toward God that attracts the Spirit of God. Yes. There's something about deciding that I'm going to, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We are going to walk in this thing. We are going to walk in reverence of who God is. There's something about that that attracts the Spirit of God. That, that comes to comfort, that comes to assure, that comes to assist, and to make real this faith that we hold on to. Right? So, so like when we... We say that we're hoping in the, lo the love of God. We're not just hoping in some fanciful, like, just like imaginary way. This is not like a fairy tale. Like, oh, we hope something happens one day. Yeah. It's not like whenever you're sitting on the couch, you're like, I hope I get in shape one day. It's not like that. It's not like this hope that leads to disappointment. It's this, it's this hope that's been proven. Yes. Amen. We're not, we're not hoping in some mystical idea. No, we are hoping to see again the love that has been openly displayed by God when He sent His Son Jesus. Yeah. It's not just this thing that we have to like, maybe you have no, it's, it's already been put on display. Our hope is not some romantic idea. Our hope is in a proven love put on display by a father sending a son to die to win back those lost and separated from him. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It was already proven. It was already shown. It was already put on display. And now our hope is in that. Yes. And then that would come. And then that, we would, that would be fulfilled. There is a God in heaven who loves you. He sent his son to die in your place that you would be his own. And it's not going to come through like your ambition, your desire, like your, your drive or your, your you know, willpower or your ability to make this thing happen. It comes through submission and it comes through surrender and it comes through trust and it comes through hope. And that's what we're talking about when it says it delights God that we would walk in, that we would fear him and that we would hope in him. It, it's hard to hope. I got one person who knows the truth. It's hard to hope. It's hard to hold on. It's hard to keep holding whenever holding on whenever you haven't seen it come to pass. It's, it's hard to carry on and to persevere and hope. But can I tell you to hold on no matter what? Just keep holding, keep holding, keep holding on. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred. This just relates to our truth. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. I don't know that's right. <laughs> when it doesn't happen, when it still hasn't happened, and it's, man, when you're 25 and you still see it, you're like, man. I thought I'd be married, but I got it, you know. Then you get married and you're like, man, I've been married forever now. This is great. Right? <laughs> Love it. Never happier. But, you know, the expectation for something to happen that doesn't happen, you know. We moved home and I told y'all this, like, I worked in the sewer plant for like a year. And I was like, good God, this is you. What, what about all the hopes I had, God? What about, not just turds floating around, like, what about all the hope that I had, God? Like, what, 
where, where did that go? Like, what, you know, so there's, there's a disappointment that comes with hope not happening. With, with just keep hoping, just keep hoping. Because it continues and says, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Yeah. Desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Trees take time to grow. Mm. Don't know that? Yeah. Trees take time to grow. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, right? Yep. The second best day is today. So trees take, they take a long time to grow. So hope, uh, a hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree life. Alone deferred is awesome, but hope deferred is <laughs> not awesome, right? It makes the heart sick. And that word sick, sick, the Hebrew word for it, it means to grow sick, obviously, or to become weak. So a hope deferred causes us to grow weak, it says. And when we become weak, we don't want, I don't want none of that. I'm going to let go. Right? I'm, a, I'm about to buy some dumbbells, and I was like, man, I'm kind of weak. Like, I can still got the dad muscles, like, I pick up my kids, but, like, the other stuff, I'm like, she's like, can you get all the waters? I'm like, yeah. No. This is be easier. Right? So, I'm growing weak in some areas. Uh, hope, you know, hope deferred causes us to grow weak, and yeah. we don't like that. So, we go get our gym memberships, and we, we all go back to the gym, we all get stronger again, because we don't like being weak. Right? We don't like being in a position of helplessness. We don't like not being able to make something happen for ourselves. And so whenever we're hoping for something and we're trusting in God and He hasn't come through yet, or so we think, it causes us to lose hope. It causes us to grow weak. And holding on, you know, it, it can be difficult. But how many know that when you're weak, the stage is set? Yeah. Come on, when, when you're weak, like the curtain's been pulled back, come on, we got, we got, we got a God in heaven who starts, oh, that looks like weakness over there. Let me, let me see what I know. But how many of y'all know, like, when we begin to feel and identify with the weakness and when we refuse... To, to just, you know, keep a mask up and a shred, like, no, it's all good. When we begin to identify with the weakness that we have and our inability, how many of you know that that, that that starts to set the stage for God to show up? Amen. That, that Amen. it's actually in the weakness, it weakness, it's the perfect platform for the strength of God. Yes. When, when, we, when we have a weakness and an inability in our in our own uh, person, in our own abilities, come on, that is a perfect setting for God to step in and yeah. strength. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather have His strength than my own. Yes. I would much rather depend yes. on, his, on His mighty power. Come on, on all the things that we say, I would rather, much rather depend on the God who is all-knowing and all-powerful and is on all places and who numbers all the stars yes. and who, who just with His voice sends uh, uh, authority and commands and creates. I, I would much rather be tied in and associated to that source of yeah. power than yeah. my own. So let me be like Paul and say, like, I, I'll tell you that I'm weak. I'll tell you that I don't have enough because when I do that, it actually sets the stage for God to show up in strength. So though, even though it still hurts, even though I keep hoping and I feel myself growing weak, I'm not going to run from that. I'm not going to hide from that. I'm not going to stop hoping in God because as I hope in God, I grow weaker because the hope, it just keeps getting put off. The, it just keeps being deferred. And I feel my heart growing sicker and sicker. And I, it's becoming, it seems more hopeless. And so I'm feeling more weak and more weak. And then in that moment, God shows up. In that moment, God's yeah. strength is revealed. Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you that there's like an easy way. Like the pain that we go through, that we endure as we hope, is part of the process. It's part of maturing. It's part of uh, of being disciplined. It's part of growing into a mature believer and growing into uh, a, a mature adult. Even like pain is part of the process. But how many know that God redeems that pain? Amen. That everything that the, the enemy meant for evil, everything that he meant to harm you, to destroy you, that God actually turns around and makes it work for, yeah. for good, uh, for his glory. Yeah. And he's actually redeeming us. That's why he tells us to, to, to endure and he tells us to embrace suffering and to respond with joy and, and to have these certain reactions because he's at work in that process. God is not refining you to destroy you. He's not holding you to the fire to destroy you. He's holding you to the fire to refine you, to make you more like him. To bring into your lives the desires. See, some of the things that you're hoping for got to die. Some of the things that you think you want, George Shea said the best, are you, they got to die. Maybe it wasn't George Shea. Who was it? Oh, I thank God. Oh, some of that stuff's got to die. Yeah. So that God can bring in the best. So that God can bring in what you really need. What you really want that you don't even know. And so as this, those things begin to die off, come on, he's beginning to refine you and to make you more like him. And so that what he brings into your life, the promise fulfilled, is a tree of life. It's the tree of life. It's a, it's, a, it's a source that will sustain you every day of your life. To walk in the provision and the promise of God. And so we're finishing up, we're finishing up here, but um, that's why it says hope in steadfast love. It, pre, it 
pleases God when we hope in His steadfast love. Not when we hope in our ability to make it happen. Not when we hope in when we get that raise one day. Not when we hope in when we get that new car. Not when we hope in what's going to happen. When we hope instead in the steadfast love of God. Steadfast, faithful, committed, loyal, proven, come on, rock steady. When, when we hope in that love, that's pleasing to God. Our weakness humbles us and it causes us to look to God and to lean on Him. Amen. But what did it tell us in the same song? That God does what to the humble? Listen, He resists the proud. He fights against those who've got it figured out for themselves. He, he resists the proud, but he lifts up the humble. Those that allow themselves to go through this process of pain, that go through this process of disappointment, that go through this, you know, where, where some of these things are dying off. And as we go through that, he actually draws near and he lifts up the humble. And he fulfills those desires that we truly have. And it becomes a tree of life, becomes a source of nourishment. This word, uh, girl weak, it's used in Isaiah 53, 10 also. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Yet yeah, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. You ever wonder, God, what the heck? It was the will of God to crush his son. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to become counted righteous. Amen. Guys, there are no shortcuts with God. His, his own son was put to death to fulfill the requirement for this righteousness that we speak of. His own son went through the process of pain. His own son went through the disappointment and the delay and, and all these things that we can identify with. He went through them so that he can identify with what we go through. And there was no shortcut for him. If anybody knew the control of the league, it was Jesus. But he endured. He stuck to the process and he went through and he endured. For what? For the joy set before him. So, the one last, one last thought here. God, the Father, did not even spare his only son from the process of pain, but it was hope in what was to come that saw it through to the end, the desire fulfilled. So for, uh, for completion of the will of the Father, which was to be your substitute, to save you from your sin, to make you a son of God. This is the love that's proven. This is the love that pleases God whenever we hope in this love, this love that he displayed and that he showed for us. And so uh, as, we, as we close out today, um, you know, we're talking about this love. Like, I don't want to just come up here and tell you, fear God. <laughs> be afraid. <laughs> Submit to God. Right? Yes, do those things. But know the love of God. Yes. Know the love, not just this idea with a sticker. No, the love he has for you. Yeah. The love yeah. that God has toward you. That he proved in his son Jesus. That you would hope in this love. So if, if uh, and you can all, I guess, close your eyes. Maybe we'll do it this way. Uh, if, if you, if you want to know this love Amen. that we're speaking about this morning, if you want to know this love that has been put on display, that is steadfast, that is loyal, that is something that you can grow in, if you want to know that, uh, then just, you know, raise your hand if you want to. Raise it in your heart. I don't, whatever. You, this is between you and God. Okay? I don't have some kind of magic dust up here that can sprinkle on you whenever you like, raise your hand. Like, I don't have that. So this is between you and God right now. Yeah. And you say, God, like I, I realize like who you are. I realize that you are worth, you know, so much that you are worth my my awe and my worship and my wonder, but I want to know this love that you have for me. I want to not just fear you, but I want to know that I belong. I want to know that that uh, I am one with you. I want to know that the promises that you have are for me. And I want to know that this proven love was not just proven to the world, but it was proven to me and that I can grow in that. So if that's you, just make that, take a moment real quick and just kind of acknowledge that with the Lord. And uh, we're praying together. Father, uh, we, we see your people. And God, we just, we thank you for, uh, we thank you for your word, God, that you reveal yourself, God, that you reveal your truth, that you show us the methods and the means to coming to you, God, and that, that you do it for our benefit. God, that you reveal to us not only your nature, God, but 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 your desires and your longings, God, and that they're for your, your children. And God, so we just pray right now that uh, you would give us the grace to identify with Jesus, that you would... Help us to uh, identify with his sacrifice, with his substitute, and not with our shortcomings, not with where we've fallen, but that we would know this love, that we would hope in this proven love for us, God, that we would grow it, 
in intimacy with you, that we would grow in relationship with you, God, that we would not be uh, swayed by the opinions of men, by the lies of our past, by the mistakes that we've, we've fallen into, God, but that we would hope in your steadfast love for us, God, that we would walk in fear of you, that we would know you, that uh, we would uh, recognize your being, but God, that we would also grow in the hope of your love, and that we would see um, it on display in our, on our behalf, God, that you would help us to begin to point out and identify or uh, your love on, on uh, display before us in our lives. We give you glory. God, we give you honor and praise for all that you're doing, for all that you are. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so again, uh, no service Wednesday, and we'll be back next week. See you guys. You're dismissed.